Hello and welcome to Programming 101. This presentation and video is brought to you by the Office of Student Activities and recognized student organizations. In an effort to provide ongoing training for students, their organizations, and student organization advisors. My name is Bill Torville. I am the Assistant Director for Student Activities and I work primarily with the Impact Programming Board, Family Weekend, Welcome Week, Homecoming, and Winter Welcome Week, and I am one of the programming experts here on the Minnesota State University Mankato campus. And with that, let's get started. Uh, a little outline of what we're going to be covering today, how to prepare and how to make sure that you're successful, um, how to find people to help you out at your events, that's a, an essential part of your event, um, what sites are available and what site is correct for what you're trying to do, um, if you need a contract, how to get one and who needs to do the negotiation, um, a little on risk management and liability insurance, and finally knowing your audience and how to promote your event. So with that, we'll get started. First thing we cannot I cannot actually emphasize enough is to prepare ahead of time. Um, the more you do farther out, the less you'll look like the person here on this screen the day of. So set a timeline. Start whether it's six months to a year out of your event, or it might be a couple months, but lay out in a progression so one year out, six months out, two months out, one month out, two weeks out, one week out, and then a 24 hours prior to the list of items and tasks that you need to do. There are resources for that on the Recognized Student Organization page. Uh, if you need additional help, you can feel free to contact me at any time. Next is determine your budget. Whatever, you, whatever your budget is will help determine what you can do and what you can bring. So how many decorations you're going to buy, if you're going to be bringing anybody doing contracts, what kind of food you can buy, can you provide snacks, stuff of that nature. So you have to fall within your budget. That's kind of your sandbox that you can play within. And finally, set your goals for what you're trying to do um, with this event and how are you going to make sure you meet those little goals. That's what we mean by assessment. So if you want people to have fun, great. How do you know if they had fun? So how are you going to survey them? Are you going to ask them? Are you going to provide options for feedback? What are you going to do to make sure you know that you met your goals for your event? Um, one of the things that's going to be important is to help find people to help you run the event. Uh, manpower is one of the most difficult things you can do for an event. If you need judges, you got to find at least five because if you want three, three will only show up if you get five because two will cancel right away. That's just one little example. So, But look at your friends all around you. Um, then they'll be able to help you out. Throughout this presentation, too, if you look on down on the bottom right-hand corner, um, as I go through different areas, there will be some contact information and some names of friends on campus who can help you plan your event. So, the first st place to stop is your friends in the event and meeting services. Um, they are um, go rigid usually called by scheduling there in CSU 219. They have a lot of variety of services for you. That's A, where you reserve where you're going to go. They'll have maps of the location for, to do mapping. Um, they can tell you what they have and what they can't provide. The next thing you want to do is, depending on where you want to go, you want to visit that location. It's extremely important. I'll give you a small example. For homecoming, we have an event um, that's going to be on the PA steps at night. It's supposed to be dark. Well, when we visited it at night, we found out that there's lots of lights. If you're supposed to be having a dark event for a DJ, you got to figure out how to get those lights off. If we hadn't visited the location at that time, we, would have had, we wouldn't have been able to resolve that issue at that time. Um, but more importantly, it shows you uh, what's available, where you want to put things, and it'll help you draw that layout, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So the question I have for you is, what do most people forget to account for when laying out their uh, uh, location setup? M some people might think it's, oh, where you're going to be entering, exiting. That's a good one to think about. We're going to be putting tables, stuff of that nature. But the one thing that people f mostly forget about is power. If you need power for anything, make sure you're putting those things close, especially if you need a lot of power for sound or lighting. One of the things that the event and meeting services will ask you to do, and it's an extremely part, uh, um, important part of the process, is to do the special events checklist. This checklist is a comprehensive list of everything that you'll need from services to items um, at your event. Uh, you can need to fill this out in the scheduling office or online. Some things that you will need to know are the outdoor music policy. So policy at Minnesota State University Mankato states that you can only have amplified sound between the hours of 11 a.m. and 1 a.m. so it does not dist uh, um, excuse me 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. so it does not um, disrupt class operations. Um, that we are a dry campus so you cannot have alcohol at events 
unless you get prior approval from the president. Uh, if you do want to have catered third party, which means an outside catered vendor who has the appropriate assurance, alcohol served at your event, stop into the event and meeting services and they'll kind of fill you in a little bit more on how to do that. There's a process you have to fill out. Um, check with if you have any specific permit requirements. So if you're shutting down a street, if you're going to be using uh, Mankato Police, um, check into all of your permit requirements. Um, if you're bringing fireworks, if you're doing all kinds of weird things, just make sure you have everything covered. Um, there are some restrictions for the mall and what it can and cannot be used for, so do check that out with, um, as well as um, what can you do during your setup? So uh, that's really a lot of some of the things you need to know when doing a special events checklist. Before I talked before I talked about making a site map, this is probably one of the most important things you can do for your event. If you have anything out of the ordinary, you're gonna want to create some kind of setup diagram for the scheduling office. You have the option of uploading this in the special events checklist, and it's extremely important because then what it does is it tells them where you want your stuff. So if you, I'll use an example here. This was from Welcome Week in 2011. We, if you follow, follow my cursor here, we you see that we have specific things with a little key here. So we wanted the stage in the south end of Bresnan. Here's where the usually walk to class, right there. And we had all the items that we need. So we need tables. We need tables here, 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 here. Um, Pope, uh, ropes and standards, so that's basically crowd control rope. We want it here and here. Um, handicap seating kind of indicated where we want everything set up. So when we arrived that day, uh, a few hours early, everything was set up and ready to go. You can find these maps online um, at, if you just Google search building maps. Um, in the um, search bar on the mnsu.edu website. Otherwise, um, um, the scheduling office has those for you. Next thing we want to do is kind of uh, pr provide an example of some of the things that um, the CSU has that really can enhance your program and kind of take your program from something that's special to the next level. Uh, first thing I encourage everybody to use is these crowd control ropes. Not only does it help control the flow of the crowd, especially if you it helps create a line. So if you know you're going to be having a lot of people lining up, they know to go in the ropes and go to line. Otherwise, you'll have just a horde of people outside that are just trying to run in. Um, and they look cool. They, they make it seem more professional event. They know they really provide some error of specialty. For example, when we do Club Maverick during Welcome Week, we use those to not let people in. We let people in four or five at a time like you would at a regular club. Other thing not to forget about, especially in the uh, colder winter months, are uh, there are coat racks available uh, for people to put their coats. They can put their coats. Now, if you want to try to do, want to do a coat check-in or not, that's up to you. That is kind of a hassle to do, but if you want to do that, um, you do have to have, to have some kind of system set up. Um, the CSU provides table skirting for all of their tables. If you have a table that is not skirted, you're doing something wrong. It makes like, everything look more professional. Um, people really respect it. So you, you get to hide legs underneath it. You can put stuff underneath it. So whenever you have a table, have it skirted. Another one is the CSU has eight uh, semi-circle serp uh, serpentine tables. So you can make a serpentine like it's pictured here uh, for a buffet or for like um, um, silent auction type items. Or you can actually create a circle or half circle out of those if you want to do some kind of information table. Those are a few things that the CSU has that you can use to um, enhance your event. Um, if you have any questions for catering or parking, your friends are down in the right-hand corner. But when um, using food um, on campus, you have to use Sodexo. So all events in the Centennial Student Union are required to use Sodexo for catering. Um, anytime you have any food, water, anything of that nature, you have to go through the, um, Sodexo for catering. Outside of the CSU, it is not required, but is strongly encouraged uh, to make sure that you get safe food. Um, there are um, no frills catering available, which is basically, it's a lot less expensive, so if you just need 20 bagels for something, you go pick it up yourself and you set it up yourself and you save a significant amount of cost by having Sodexo not set it up. Um, there are food inexpensive food options. Also, if you don't see it on their catering guide, ask them. They can pretty much ink anything you want. They'll just have to uh, look up the price based upon the ingredients and the amount of labor it's going to take um, to uh, use that. Um, some, um, some notes about catering is um, the cost of the food is primarily dependent not on the food you purchase, but on the amount of labor it takes to, to make. For example, um, if 
uh, french fries are a lot cheaper than a peanut butter and jelly sandwich because you have to pay someone to put the peanut butter and jelly sandwich together. Um, that's just some things about uh, Sodexo and their food policy. Um, primarily, it should help make sure that the food is safe and they're covered under their insurance. Also on soda products, we are a Pepsi campus currently. Um, so if um, any soft drinks need to be Pepsi. Um, another thing to consider is also parking. If you're going to be having a lot of people park, how are you going to arrange for parking? Um, if you want people to visit park in the visitor pay lot, they either need to pay themselves or you do need to purchase um, purchase um, vouchers from the scheduling office. Um, a couple notes is for visitor parking uh, is allowed and gold lots after 6.30 p.m. Monday through Thursday and ends at 4 p.m. on Fridays is open on the weekends. So gold lot on the weekends are open if you do need to use those if you're probably having a few people come. Um, do check with the scheduling office if you are going to have significant parking needs. They do need to make arrangements. One of the most important things that you're going to do is pick where you want to go. So I have a list of some things to consider here when you're sele um, selecting the location. So are you going to need significant special needs access? So how how well um, can someone in a wheelchair access it? Um, if it's going to if there's a lot of steps, um, just things of those, those are things to think about. Um, are you going to need extra trash cans afterwards for trash? That's a lot of things people forget about. Are you going to need security? Is this something where you're going to need security and hire private security through? You can coordinate that through the security office over in the Weeking Center. Um, are the are restrooms in um, a pro in good location so they're not too far away? Are there enough restrooms? Are you having a thousand people and only have four restrooms? That might be an issue. Um, how are people going to move through the space and to the space? It's something to think about. So when you're setting up a fair of or nature, make sure you have a wide enough aisle. Make sure that you know you're directing people in a way that you want them to go, so it's not just a big mess of people. Um, as we talked about before, is there power in the, in the location, and how are you going to get power to your areas? Um, how, where are you going to be having people park? Um, and what kind of audio and visual resources are available? For most uh, anything in the CSU, there is a, a wide variety of audio and visual resources available. Once you go outside the Centennial Student, it does get limited a little bit, but do check with uh, event and meeting services to see if they are able to provide um, audio and visual resources outside at your venue, outside of the Centennial Student Union. And lastly, when is the building open? If you're going to have an event that's past the building hours, you may have additional charges and staff to keep that building open. So just a few things to consider when selecting a location. Um, finally, max capacity. Make sure you're not going into your max capacity. Some of the primary places you can reserve um, for events is one of them is the Centennial Student Union Ballroom. It fills up very quickly. Space, um, it does get reserved quite quickly, so get that priority deadline from event meeting services a semester in advance to make sure you reserve the ballroom. Uh, next, a uh, great um, venue is CSU Ostrander. Um, it's great for small performances, movies, speakers, lectures. It seats a little over 300 and has a bunch of audio and visual technology already in there. Um, wonderful, wonderful space recently renovated. Um, Trafton C121 can fit a large amount of people, a little bit more than Ostrander. So if Ostrander's book, you need just a formal lecture. Wonderful way to um, do a lecture or performance and that is typically available after hours, after business hours. And finally, there is Weeking 220 um, that does uh, will work well for presentations and large lectures. Those are a few of the air, um, places um, that you can reserve on campus. And we're coming up to the end of the video here, so um, a little brief about contracts. I'll start that on the next video, on video number two. Um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to contact the Centennial Student Union or uh, Student Activities. Um, uh, I will be more than willing to answer any questions you may have on um, advanced um, setups. Um, there are additional resources on the uh, Recognized Student Organization page and as well as Impact. So any questions, let us know. Uh, we're going to continue with contracts and risk management in video two.